welcome to DC Today. I got invited back. Uh, I'm here filling in for David Bonson as he is speaking in Florida. The last couple of days, you guys had Brian Zaitel. Yesterday, you'll have David Bonson back tomorrow. Uh, today was an interesting day in markets. We got uh, more of kind of the theme we've seen all year, where it's this high dispersion. Um, some people describe that dispersion of value versus growth. Other people talk in terms of duration. Uh, but what you saw was a big difference between the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ. Uh, Dow Jones was basically flat on the day. I think it was up two points, which was maybe 0.01%. Uh, S&P was down 0.74%, and the NASDAQ was down 2.04%. That's the dispersion I'm talking about. You have a Dow flat, you have a NASDAQ down 2%. Uh, the next good question to ask would be, where does that attribution come from? It's actually a really easy answer. You had a couple very large technology companies report uh, after close yesterday, and the earnings were underwhelming. So you saw a huge retreat in some very high capitalization tech companies. What I mean by high capitalization is that if you were to look at an index of something like the S&P 500 or even the NASDAQ, as we're referencing today, uh, and you look at the top 10 holdings, these high capitalization companies make up a huge percentage of the index. So when you have movement there, uh, it has a, a big impact on what the bottom line or end result is. Uh, that's why when you look at uh, kind of by sector performance, you saw energy had a huge up day uh, where energy was up 1.36%. And um, obviously there's not really any energy exposure in the NASDAQ. Uh, you have something like communication services, again, a newer sector that they created to grab some of the social media companies, search engine companies, uh, that was down 4.75% on the day. Uh, that's uh, a wild difference when you have a sector up nearly 1.5%, and then you have another sector knocking on the door of being down 5%. But that's not new to us. That's what we've experienced most of this year. Uh, and again, if you listen to the pundits, there's a lot of different ways to talk about it. You can say that people are focused on quality earnings, uh, quality free cash flow, um, you can say that investors are less willing to give companies uh, time to kind of fit into the stock prices that they're at. Uh, one way we've heard it said is duration, right? That's a very common term we use when we're talking about bonds. We understand uh, the sensitivity to movements in interest rates. If I own a, a three-month bond and there's a move in interest rates, it's going to have a lot less of an impact than if I own a 30-year bond. Uh, now, when we talk about that in terms of stocks. Uh, well, over the last decade or so, we've seen uh, a lot of stocks rise up in their valuation. And it wasn't so much a rise in earnings uh, as much of a rise in multiple. And we've come to begin to call those high duration stocks. So when they report earnings or when we see big moves in interest rates, um, when you're discounting those future earnings back to the net present value, uh, people are less willing to price something at 40, 50, 60, 70 times earnings as much as they were over the last, uh, like I said, five to 10 years. Now, another way you can look at that is uh, that is a bubble in some form, right? And where people have trouble talking about bubbles is when you're in one, because when you see your friends and family member making money from the bubble, uh, you begin to get interest. Uh, you begin to want to participate. But we also know that the way real bubbles work, imagine if you were blowing, uh, if you have bubble gum and you're blowing a bubble, uh, they do get bigger before they pop. Uh, coming into this year, there was a lot of talk about relating 2022 to something that was starting to feel like uh, the late 90s uh, in, in the tech bubble. Uh, again, it's been said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. So again, what we saw today is very much a theme we've been seeing all year. Um, when we look at treasuries, the 10-year treasury, it moved slightly. Uh, it was down about nine basis points. I say slightly because uh, it feels like the 10-year has been so volatile all year. Still above 4%, sitting at about 4.01%. We had two publications on kind of key economic data. Um, you had new home sales, which again, uh, the expectation would be that new home sales would be light. Uh, in September, the reported numbers um, were, they fell month over month. So it was 603,000. Uh, prior month was 677,000. 
but that 603 was still above estimates. Uh, the average estimate on the street was about 593,000. Keep in mind, you go back to, I believe it was, let me look at my notes, August of 2020. Uh, and this would be a good number to remember or anchor to. Those new home sales were 1.04 million. So I think you can look at that as a number, like a million homes sold. But you can also look at it as what economics really are, human behavior. So we go back to that date of August 2020, and we start to think, what was happening? Well, we know the talks of COVID were getting um, stronger and stronger at the beginning of the year, right? January, February, we saw the markets throw up in March. Then we know the seasonality of home sales, right? If you're going to sell a home, uh, especially in Southern California, you probably want to sell it in the middle of summer right? Where the weather's good. Um, people want to be in the pool. They want to be outside. Uh, you get a premium price. There's a seasonality to it. So again, what's happening in 2020? Human behavior. Everyone's staying home. Everybody's getting very familiar with their own home. Um, everybody's getting a little bit of cabin fever. Then you hit summer uh, where, again, home sales should be uh, uh, peaking. So that $1 million, the 1 million home sales, I think it's a significant number. And for me, it's uh, interesting to kind of think through, oh, that's what economics is, right? It's the psychology of how um, we all behave intersecting with this idea of supply and demand. So in August of 2020, you had low and favorable interest rates, and you had people that were very interested in buying more home and new home. Um, second homes and different things like that as they didn't know what the future had in store and they were spending a lot of time at home. Uh, the other key economic data we got uh, was looking at the trade deficit. So September, that trade deficit widened by 5.7%. Uh, again, one of the things uh, or my goals here on the DC Today is not only to give the economic data, but also for those of us that don't maybe follow this stuff on a daily basis is, hey, what does this mean to me? So uh, we understand that that deficit number is going to have uh, you know, a somewhat significant attribution to the GDP numbers, which is kind of like the main scorecard or report card for uh, it, economics. And why would that deficit be widening? Um, let's keep it really simple. There's a lot of things we could talk about, but the U.S. dollar has been very strong. What does a strong U.S. dollar mean? It means foreigners wanting to buy stuff from the US, they're not gonna be able to buy as much stuff because uh, as they transition their money into the US dollar, strong dollar means they're gonna be able to buy less. It's gonna be the opposite here. Uh, if we're buying things overseas, we're gonna be able to buy a little bit more. So that strong dollar is gonna mean that you're going to see uh, uh, a falling of exports, uh, but you're gonna see a rise of imports, which, the way the math works, that's going to widen the trade deficit. So uh, the U.S. dollar has been extremely strong. One thing David mentioned is uh, one of the curses is that if you end up on the cover of Barron's magazine, uh, that usually uh, does not bode well for you in the future. Barron's did a cover story on the U.S. dollar. It was a, a picture, I, I believe uh, it was the dollar. So it was George Washington uh, with a big muscle and flexing. So um for any of us out there, the few people that play video games, it's kind of the curse of the, the Madden cover. Um, you never want to be on the front of the video game cover because uh, that usually means you're going to get hurt next year or something of that nature. So we'll see how the US dollar performs. Again, for all of us out there that uh, are disappointed that we have some sort of exposure to the emerging markets in, in our portfolio, uh, I will remind you that that strong dollar is a big headwind for emerging markets. And when that does reverse, a headwind will become a tailwind, uh, and uh, we'll see if that becomes opportunistic for investors. Um, looking at my other notes here, I did add a little tidbit today, and uh, it, it was just kind of uh, something I found interesting that I read on Monday on Bloomberg. One of the quotes I mentioned last time on DC Today that uh, I find pretty interesting is that somebody said, and I, I kind of remember who said it because I want to give them credit, but they were saying this is the most anticipated recession uh, of all time. And, and the point that I'm making there is that you have to think of the narrative and the numbers. You have to think of the average feeling of uh, every single American uh, versus the data that's actually getting published. And 
there is a slight amount of cognitive dissonance there. So what I put in here was three different charts uh, that Joe Weisenthal from Bloomberg posted on Monday. And the first chart was basically just showing survey results. So they're going to do these surveys about uh, confidence surveys. And they're trying to give a, a general idea of kind of how do people feel out there, uh, investor sentiment, things of that nature. And there's going to be average estimates of what those surveys will come out as. And then there's going to be the actual results of those surveys. So when you look at the first chart, you'll see that the actual results of the surveys were worse than the estimates. So there was a higher amount of pessimism uh, than the average uh, uh, economic uh, forecaster would have guessed. Now, the next two charts that I put in here, one is on, uh, I believe it was industrial production, and the other was labor markets. And then you see all the data there was a surprise to the upside. Now, this is actual data. So these are you know, economists on average saying that we think labor markets are going to look like X, or we think industrial production is going to be Y. And then the actual results are compared to the average estimates. So those were, on average, a surprise to the upside. Again, I'm sharing a lot there, but all I'm saying is that the general feeling out there, going back to what I said, the most anticipated recession of all time, the general feeling out there is pretty negative. And that general negative feeling means that the averages that people think are going to be results on uh, a lot of this published data is not as good as it comes in. So what do you take from that? Maybe people are a little bit more pessimistic right now than they need to be. And uh, I always mention this book. Uh, there's a book that is basically a yearbook of uh, stock market results uh, all across the globe. And the, the title of the book, it's republished every year. The title of the book is The Triumph of the Optimist. Now, why is that important to you? Well, if everybody you go out to coffee with and everybody you watch Sunday football with and everybody at your Bible study is telling you how bad things are going to be, that's going to have an influence on you. And I just want you to be careful to not let that influence lead you to take action because right now it feels like there's a greater amount of pessimism than probably is warranted. Now, again, that's not me making a prediction about the future. That's me trying to protect you from an investor behavior standpoint. So last thing, I'll encourage you to go to the actual written where David has uh, his Ask David section. Really simple, easy question today. A, a reader was asking, how do you go about picking dividend stocks? Is there certain metrics or measurements, uh, minimum dividend yields or things that you focus on? Uh, David elaborates on that. Tomorrow, you'll have Quite, amount, uh, quite a big amount of uh, economic data being published. And also you'll have uh, your normal DC Today uh, author, David Bonson, back with you. And he will be with you for the long form Dividend Cafe on Friday as well. Uh, and that's all I have for today. So this is Trevor Cummings signing off on the DC Today. Mm -hmm.